Today's sermon is Grace Alone Raises the Dead. Grace Alone Raises the Dead. I'm going to start off with some questions just to get our minds framed, and then we'll turn to our primary scripture today, which is from Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. But first, some, some questions. Uh, you may not be good at statistics. You may not know all the data. And if you need to, to punt today, that's okay. If you need to go back and check the internet for some reliable sources, I'll totally understand. But just, just if, you, if you're willing to be a little bit courageous here, play along with me if you would. Now, you can see some of these questions and, and the blank spaces in the sermon notes that are printed in the bulletin. The likelihood that I will die, the likelihood that you will die, unless Jesus returns very soon, uh, what would you place that percentage as? The likelihood that you or I will die unless Jesus returns very soon. You, you got, a, got an answer on that? 15%, 20%, what, what do you think it is? I've got some people saying 100% out there and they know the answer. Yes, 100% likelihood that you will die unless Jesus returns very soon. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says that you and I have two primary appointments in all of our existence. It is appointed for each person, for man, to number one, die. It's your first major appointment. After your birth is your death, okay? And the next one is the judgment, judgment, okay? So it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. In his magisterial, The Denial of Death, this is not a Christian writer. I do commend it for you for maybe a point of reference. I don't commend it to you for inspirational or <laughs> divinely inspired reading. Ernst, Ernst Becker's The Denial of Death. Ernest Becker famously made the argument, his thesis was that contrary to the typical conventional wisdom that human psychology and human societies from a sociological and anthropological standpoint are primarily oriented to uh, secure us, to protect us. His argument was, no, no, no. The way our minds work, the way our psychology works, and the way societies work, and the way the things we do in societies, from the way we do religion, to entertainment, to everything else, that our driving concern of individuals and of society is to develop psychological and societal strategies to fend off our awareness of our mortality. In other words, we spend a lot of time and effort trying to deny and avoid the idea that you and I are gonna die. Um, and that death is real and final. Uh, we, we spend uh, most of our internal psychological drive on this, societal drive on this, you know, we entertain ourselves to death, of course, as some books refer to it as, uh, to deny our awareness of our vulnerability to death and to escape into our daily diversions. I'm just so busy, I have so much stuff going on, oh, it's just so cool, it's so bad or it's so good, into our daily diversions and into false feelings that we're immortal. He may die, but I'm not going to die. And by the way, if I do die, I'll continue forever in the memories and in the hearts of people who are also going to die. Go figure that out logically, right? Now, let me ask you some other questions, too. The, um, what would you put as the number of beings with authority over death and life, including the ability to raise the dead. How many beings, how many beings have authority over death and life? Some of you are gonna tell me your favorite presidential candidates have that kind of power. If we can just get him elected, everything's gonna be great. So maybe we run up the number because there are a lot of people running for president. Maybe it's your best friends, maybe it's your grandmama, I don't know. But what's the actual answer here? How many beings? have authority over death and life and can raise the dead? One. One being, the divine being, three persons. 
Now, the percentage of people worthy, now that we know that God is the one who raises the dead, the percentage of people who are worthy to be raised from the dead, can you fill that in on the sermon notes? Most popular polls in the United States say that most people are basically good, and therefore a majority of people uh, would certainly be deserving of being raised from the dead. Where would you put that number? I think a lot of Americans would probably put it at least at 80, 85 percent, maybe a few psychopaths and a few people who are really bad and people who vote for the wrong candidate for president. Maybe they don't deserve it, but most of the rest of the people do. What would you place that percentage as? People who deserve to be raised from the dead and to live with God forever. The answer is zero. Zero of us deserve to be raised from the dead and to live with God forever. Um, people, the percentage of people worthy to be healed, a lot of times we think, well, if God is there and if God is good, he obviously has to heal me every time I have a problem and he needs to heal everybody I like. But let's just think about this. The percentage of people who actually who are worthy to be healed is what? Again, sorry, I know I'm the cold shower today, but it's reality, zero percent. Because the question is this, how can I, otherwise dead in sin, if I believe the Bible and the Bible tells me I am dead in sin, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, how can I, otherwise dead in sin, be saved? Dead people certainly don't do anything to get themselves saved and certainly don't save themselves. How can I be raised from death? Which brings us back to our sermon for today. Grace alone raises the dead. We're going to turn now to our scripture from Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Luke 7, 11 through 17, picking up immediately following what we read last week from Luke 7, verses 1 through 10, about the centurion with a uh, severely ill servant or slave whom Jesus healed. The, the centurion is commended for his faith. Now we move on, and Jesus moved on to uh, this next encounter that Luke wants to highlight for us. And it came to pass soon afterward, he, this means Jesus, went into a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. Now, as he approached the gate of the, the town, that's, Luke uses the term palace, but it's a little town, city, this town, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the town was with her. And having seen her, the Lord was moved by compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Then fear gripped all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And the report about this spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country about him, concerning him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So with our passage today, we're going to just, first of all, note in the first couple of verses, uh, Luke 7, verses 11 through 12, we have crossing paths in Nain, several crossing paths in Nain, two crowds, two only sons, two crowds, two only sons, as well as Jesus and a an otherwise hopeless, short of Jesus' encounter, widow. Jesus 
and a grieving widow who's just lost her only son. Now, first of all, let's look at where this happens. We have this little town of Nain, which is probably the same as the little predominantly Arab village that's about six miles southwest of Nazareth. Right now, you, you've got a little over 200 people living in this little village to this very day, mostly Arab, uh, six miles southwest of Nazareth. And what is happening is, and by the way, Nain, uh, it's called Nain now, is uh, at the foot of the little Hebron over the valley of Jezreel. What's happened is most likely this widow who has one son, one son only. Her one hope, her one means of provision and protection, her one means of, you know, there's not, we don't have uh, Medicare and Social Security in those days in Israel. This is, her son is her source of support and income. He's died. And he's probably died that very day. The typical Jewish tradition and predilection was to bury someone uh, before sundown of the day that that person died. And this seems to be a midday to an afternoon event that we're dealing with. So the son probably died early that morning. Uh, we're, you know, maybe a half day later on into the day. And they have anointed his body. This is the way the Jews did it, heavy anointing. Um, and he's being carried out so that everyone can see his corpse. It's an open corpse in a bier, uh, some, maybe some pretty lattice around it, but you're basically looking at a plank or an open coffin, and they're carrying this young man, his corpse, out, uh, out of the town gate so that he can be buried outside the little town. It's probably a hot day, sweaty, um, you know, it's not necessarily the, the prettiest scene you're ever going to see. And then we have Jesus surrounded by a very large crowd. There's all kinds of people who are all excited about Jesus, this miracle worker, and is he going to bring the revolution, and is he going to establish Israel, or are we going to kick out the Romans and finally have the golden age that was promised to David and the, the prophets talk about? Uh, we don't know, but he's doing a whole lot of miracles. You've got all those folks. You've got some would-be disciples who later are going to fall away from Jesus. And then you have his inner core of disciples, probably around uh, 70, 80 inner core of disciples, including, of course, at the center of it all, his 12 apostles and a few of the women who are very close uh, to that group. So you've got this big crowd surrounding uh, the only son of God, Jesus, who's come in the flesh. And you've got another crowd. It's a smaller crowd, but it's a, 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 a if you remember the Nikonos term that I used last week, I gave it to you for being worthy so it's an appropriate size little you know, crowd around the widow uh, as she goes out uh, for the burial of her only son. These two crowds meet. Very different moods in the two different crowds. One crowd is all into, is this the Messiah and what's he gonna do and what's happening? And another crowd around a woman who has just lost basically everything. She's hopeless. She's probably poor in the first place. She's from a little town that is not known as having any kind of resources, and she, her, her one and only son has just died. But of course, what's gonna happen is, it's not really about the crowds, is it? It's not really about what everybody thinks. It's gonna be about what one person thinks and does, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is gonna intersect not only the crowd, but specifically the grieving widow and mother. I'll give you a few more statistical questions. How many times is the town of Nain mentioned in the Bible? How many times? Many of you are students of Jeremiah, some of the other prophets. Some of you know First and Second Samuel quite well, maybe the Kings, the Chronicles. Um, so just, let's just walk through this. How many times is Nain mentioned in the Bible? I'll hold that thought because you're going to have the same answer to this next question. It's in the notes as well. 
the number of persons there on the scene at Nain with authority over life and death? The answer to both questions is one. Nain is mentioned one time in the entire Bible, and there's only one person there who has authority over life and death that, you know, midday or afternoon with this funeral. Now we're going to come to verse 13, which is the pivotal verse in this small passage that we're looking at today. It's power packed. And having seen her, Jesus sees the widow and grieving mother. You understand what I'm saying? He is surrounded by a massive crowd of people who are following him all around Galilee because they think the revolution and the glory is about to come. He's got his group of inside that massive crowd. He's got his group of 70 or 80 or 90, you know, inner disciples around him. And we've got this little kind of pipsqueak crowd following a woman outside the same town that for whatever reason, by God's providence, I mean, why would Jesus go to Nain, right? <laughs> it's a little town. It's never mentioned in the Bible. It's certainly not in the prophecies. But Jesus goes there. And not only does he go there surrounded by this massive crowd, Jesus sees her. And what I want you to understand is Jesus can see you. No matter how big the crowd. I mean, I was with a whole lot of people last night at a football game. But in the end, the football game doesn't matter and the crowd doesn't matter, does it? Though? There's one person who actually matters. Jesus can see you if you're his. That's just amazing. And no matter if you're from the smallest town in Mississippi or Alabama or Florida, the Panhandle, wherever. Jesus sees her, and having seen her, I mean, what's she going to do for his ministry? Why would he be interested in her? Most people say, who cares about her? She's done for. Having seen her, uh, this woman who's just lost her only son, and let me go ahead and clarify something there, because it's, it's there in verse 13. Neoniskos is the term that's used for this young man, okay? This means he's young and he's not married. He's young, he's not married. Pretty big age range here. He could be anything from a, an older teenager all the way into maybe even his early 30s, but he's not married. And so let me clarify what I'm saying to you about this. This means He's not married and he doesn't have a son. This woman doesn't have a grandson. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's not like he's 40 years old and he's got an 18 or 19 year old, you know, her grandson who's gonna now step in and take care of her. This is it. The line is over. It's, it's done. Neoniscos. So this widow of this Neoniscos, um, the Lord sees her. He sees her. And let me highlight something else for you here, too, in Luke. This is the first time Luke, as the narrator, not reporting what other people say, but as the narrator, is referring to Jesus. And we're supposed to catch this. It, it pops out at you if you're actually reading it now. Uh, the first time he uses hakurios, Luke himself, as the narrator, calls Jesus the Lord. And when Luke uses that term, he means the Lord, as in the Son of God on earth. This is who we're talking about. Now, now if you know Luke, you've, you've been hearing this term used with respect to Jesus off and on. Of course, it's used with respect to, to God. It's sometimes just used as a, as a deferential term to somebody who's higher up societally. But you may remember the angel in the announcement to the shepherds in the field. You know this if you ever come to church on Christmas Eve, right? <laughs> The angel said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah, Christ, what? Lord, right? Now, we've had other situations where, for instance, when Jesus causes the miracle, uh, the miraculous catch of fish out in the Sea of Galilee, when there's no way it's going to happen, Simon Peter says, 
Lord, away from me. I'm a sinful man. You've also had people referring to Jesus as Lord. Even most recently, the centurion refers to Jesus as Lord. We don't know exactly what that means. He ends up clearly indicating the centurion does, that he understands that Jesus has direct access to divine power. But when he uses Kyrios with respect to Jesus, Lord, you don't need to come to me. I, I'm not worried they'd have you come under my roof. We don't know exactly what that means. Here, when Luke uses it, he's being very definite for us. He's flat out laying it out now. And Luke is going to use that term for Jesus more than the other gospel writers do. Any of them. Luke most frequently uses it. Matthew and Mark are very reticent to use that term. They only use it occasionally. Luke starts using it a whole lot. And here, the rubber just hit the road. So who is it that sees the woman? Specifically, it is the Lord. The Lord Jesus, who is the Son of God, the Savior, who has power over death and life, and is the Lord of the resurrection. So, having seen her, the Lord, what happens? The Lord was moved with what? What do you fill in the blank on on the sermon notes there? He's moved with the term that Luke uses here is a term that's used sometimes by the gospel writers, Luke, Matthew, Mark, when they talk about Jesus having compassion on the crowds. But here it's for just one little bitty woman, a little widow. Esplank miste. It means literally his insides, his bowels are moved. And in kind of higher level Greek, what it means is the seat of his affections within himself are moved, are touched. Did you know that Jesus, when he sees you, can be moved with compassion? That's incredible. These, these words are just so power-packed. So Jesus sees the woman, and within himself, something happens. He's moved by compassion for her and he says to her do not weep verse 14 then he came up and touched the beer now under standard Jewish regulation the funeral plank or the open casket itself is unclean he's not supposed to be touching that he will become ritually defiled but he goes up, and you know, these other guys are carrying it. Jesus goes up and touches the beer. Now, by the way, technical note, he does not touch the corpse itself. So actually, under law specifically, he's not violating any defilement standard there. But he touches the beer. Those who are bearing it, carrying it, stop. And he says, young man, I say to you, Arise. Now, this, this guy's dead. <laughs> Does Jesus have power to talk to the dead? What do you think? Yeah. I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And then catch this. And Jesus gave him grace now, grace now. Jesus gave him to his mother. And fear gripped all, and they started hailing, saying, the great prophet has risen among us. Don't have time to go into this, but by the way, there are general superficial parallels here with the situation when um, Elijah is used by God to raise the widow of Zarephath's son from the dead after Elijah's been living with her for a long time, and you know, the miraculous kind of perpetuation of the bread, and uh, then what, what happens is the son dies and she gets all upset and Elijah gets all upset. And you may remember this, Elijah gets mad at God and said, why have you allowed this to happen, God? And you've kind of ruined my witness with this woman and what's the plan? I totally don't understand. And Elijah's all confused and upset. But then he goes up and he lays down on the, on the corpse of the young man three times and prays to God. And God raises, uh, resuscitates the dead young man back to life. Similarly, uh, with Elisha, 
uh, with the raising of the Shunammite's son. So what these people are saying, what the popular folks, the popular conventional wisdom is saying is, man, he, Jesus is just like Elijah and Elisha. He's as great as Elijah and Elisha. And even when I look at some uh, translations, some English translations, I think it's even in the e ESV, it, the headline will be for like sections will be like, Elijah raises, you know, the, the, the widow of Zarephath's son. Did Elijah raise the widow of Zarephath's son? Is that a correct heading in the English translation? What do you think? Who, did, did Elijah even know what was going on? Who was the one being who had power to raise back to life uh, the widow's son back in Zarephath? It's not Elijah. It's God. In this situation that we just read, does Jesus get all mad and confused about this young man being dead? No. Does Jesus throw himself on the young man and pray and maybe somehow God will raise the young man? No. Who commands the dead to rise? Jesus himself, because Jesus himself has that power. He is God. Are you calling on Jesus? He has the power to raise the dead. He has the power to bring forth life from death. He has the power to turn around whatever is going on in your life. Are you turning to Jesus? And do you understand that Jesus can see you? Turn your face toward him. Now, there's something else going on here, too, that I wanted to point out with Luke's uh, telling. Um, of course, the, the crowd is wrong. We know that we need to go much more upstairs than what the crowd is saying. <laughs> they, they do get that God is visiting us, but they think it's just kind of like God in general visiting us and we've got a great prophet among us. No, 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 it's not just like rewind the tape to Elijah. We're at a totally different level. Luke often highlights, I've pointed this out as we move through Luke, I'll continue to mention this to you. Luke often highlights the diversity of Jesus' ministry by specifically pairing or coupling a story about a woman and a man, a story about a man and a woman. We get that. I highlighted that in Luke chapters 1 and 2 from the get-go. You know, man, woman, woman, man. You go back and forth. Here we have it again. We just had the centurion. Now we have a woman, a widow. Luke wants us to really understand that Jesus' ministry is equally to men and women, young and old, etc. Diversity, no matter what your race, no matter what your background. We've already had the centurion Gentile and his servant, the Gentile, just be healed. Now we're dealing with a widow. Uh, but more than that, uh, let's look at the distinction here. The, the, the centurion is a kind of a self-made man, really strong, really faithful, really powerful, really impactful. This widow has nothing. So we're supposed to catch that variation too. But there's something even more I think that we need to understand. Luke is highlighting the sequence of Jesus' ministry here. So we get this in case we get confused. You may remember the Jewish elders said the centurion is worthy for Jesus to heal his servant. And of course the centurion in faith understands that he's not worthy at all. It's going to totally be of grace. But it's easy for us to walk away from that story saying, well, yeah, but Jesus commended the centurion's faith, so therefore the grace flowed from the ground of the centurion's faith. That's not the way it worked. The centurion understood the story. We sometimes tend to forget it. The ground is not the faith. It's not the human being having faith. The source in the ground is the grace of God. So in case we missed it, right after the centurion being commended by Jesus for such awesome faith, we have now this account of the widow and her dead son being raised, her dead son being raised. Uh, in this story, who has faith that Jesus can raise the dead? The crowds? Did Simon Peter step forward and say, well, Jesus, you obviously can raise the dead. Did you read that anywhere in there? Did the widow do we get a background story about what awesome faith she has? And man, she is just the greatest widow in, you know, Galilee. And this is the greatest woman of faith. Did we get any of that? Did the dead man, did he somehow in his death have powerful faith to cause Jesus to raise him from the dead? Hmm? No. There is one person who has faith on the scene there that Jesus can raise the dead. And who is that person? Jesus himself. That's it. Jesus. In this account, 
Who has faith? Jesus, the Messiah. Now, let me ask you this. What did the young man give and do to deserve being raised back to life? What did the widow do? What did she give? She built a synagogue? She do something else? Did she run a children's ministry for 50 years, you know, among the, the least, the last, and the lost? No, she didn't do a thing. What did they do to justify Jesus' saving work? Nothing. What do you do to justify his saving work for you? Nothing. What have I, a sinner, given or done that God owes me salvation? Nothing, and don't you dare touch that with a 10-foot pole. Don't even go in that direction thinking like that. What have I done that God needs to answer my prayer so he'll do what I tell him to do about this healing or that issue? Nothing, and don't you dare go near that. Instead, I want to invite you to the gospel. I set all my hope on God's grace alone. God's favor that I do not deserve at all. God's atoning mercy for me and God's compassion on the many. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the one and only son come from the father, full of what? Grace and truth. I set all my hopes on grace alone, grace alone in the crucified, risen, and returning Jesus Christ. Remember Hebrews 9:27. it's appointed for man to die and then the judgment. What does verse 28 say? So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And why? What's the direction of how God saves you? Listen to this, Ephesians chapter one, picking up at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Isn't that awesome? God chose you. If you're a Christian, God chose you before the foundation of the world. So, so that. We should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Verse 6, you have to know Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Where does this all go? What are we supposed to do in our lives, and what will we do in eternity? To the praise of his glorious grace. Do you see that? We are to live praising his total extravagant grace now and you will continue in heavenly eternity praising his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved Jesus Ephesians 2 4 and 5 but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved Grace alone raises the dead. Do you believe? If you believe it, if you receive this, it should change your heart and your life. You should look at yourself, look at God, and look at every other person totally differently. There's no one who cannot be reached by God's grace. And if you understand in all humility that it's totally by grace you have been saved, you will be more and more gracious and giving and loving towards other people. You will want to share the gospel with other people. I invite you, my beloved, to open your heart to what this means, the gospel of God's total grace on you and God willing through your witness to others, to others. Be a person who lives in the joy and in the praise of God's glorious grace. May your household May your life reflect God's grace and praise him. He is the one who raises the dead. He is the one who saves you. Trust in him and share his love with others. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.